holy mackerel, a tech company that turned into a car company with bigger visions and you're making something next level. Nature is viciously competing for material and energy and so it designs the right material and the right structure over eons. This is the turning point in human history from analog design and manufacturing of atoms to digital design and manufacturing of atoms. All right, what's up people? Well, today we're back at Velocity Invitational and this car I've got to show you because when I say it's next level, I do not mean that as buzzwords. Uh, the Zinger has completely blown me away uh, in a profound aspect of how this thing has evolved uh, from its conception uh, and how it has been engineered and created. And I'm really excited because I've got Kevin here, who's the owner of the company and started this. Kevin, thanks for chatting it up, man. Hey, thanks so much for, for having us. We're, yeah. we're excited to tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Oh my gosh, I know they're going to freak out. So before we get into all the details, and I know we can both talk about them a lot, I found out last night that party you are a huge Jim Hall Chaparral fan. Absolutely. I mean, as a, I would say child now because I'm uh, in my early 60s now. I mean, Jim Hall was an inspiration. You had somebody who went to Caltech, uh, studied aerospace, but then took that basic core math and physics understanding and in a first principles way applied that to vehicles and to racing. And if you look at what he did during those mid 60s Can-Am oh, yeah. years, all of those things, the separating aero and wings from the body, uh, direct aero to suspension, yeah. ground effects, the things that are fundamental to F1 racing today, yeah, indeed. like almost 40 years later, yes. this man created, created locally, created with a small team, and created with that first person knowledge and courage. Oh, indeed. And I'm glad we started there. And the other thing, too, the Chaparral 2A, the first composite monocoque chassis beating out Ferrari to Formula One by what, 20 some years? Yes. That's incredible. Right. And, you know, you look at that ground effects and, you know, including the vacuum car, the wing Two cars, yeah. the, you know, the, you know, uh, adjustable aero, all of those things are just incredible and came out of a small team and the mind yep. of a man who was willing to think in a first Indeed. principle way. Indeed. Well, I wanted to start with that, guys, because some of you may know my Omega car, the high efficiency recyclable car that I had done in the past. That was inspired because of all of my research and love for Jim Hall Chaparral. And when I learned that about you, that's something that as a young person has inspired you to build your own car. So let's let's get on to that. You were a tech company that turned into a car company with bigger visions and you're making something next level. What's the deal with that? Sure. So going back 15 years ago, I had co-founded an EV car company and uh, an EV battery design company. And by doing that, I started to look at the overall auto industry and what direction it was, hap it was going. And as I looked at it, I saw everything being digitalized yes. except for the core manufacturing that really makes an auto what it is. Yes. And so I thought now is the time to move from the IBM Selectric to Mac Desktop Publishing in terms of auto manufacturing. And so about seven years ago started this company mm -hmm. using a clean sheet architecture for a digital manufacturing system for autos. Yes. And as you create that first system, obviously it's going to create a new architecture. It's going to, going to create a multi-material, multi-component architecture super optimized using digitalization yes. and high performance computing and it's going to have functional integration integrate brake caliper into upright integrate ev motor into crash structure and so you need something that is the development platform yes. for that and i said why not do something that is really a reflection of what fundamentally i would think would be the coolest most creative thing that i could do and make it a performance car, make it a, you know, in a way, a Jim Hall, John von Neumann Indeed. tribute vehicle. And the result is the Zinger 21C, yes. which, you know, I then at a certain point, it went from technology demonstrator to say, now that I have this system, use it to, sh to say, this is the apex of what can be created yes. by human AI yes. technology symbiosis. And here is the new business model for vehicle uh, vehicle companies. Yeah. It's going to 
you know, the equivalent of fabulous chip design, fabulous car design. On that note, you've got your brake caliper upright right here on display, I believe, yes? Yes. Let's take a look at that because I think this this illustrates an example right now what's going on. And this also talks about your AI creation and evolution. So why is this so beautifully organic? Let's start there for everybody. Well, it's organic not because we're trying to create something that mimics nature in the aesthetic, but because we're creating something that mi mimics nature in the process. Indeed. It's, Meaning it's... you're taking a design space and you're saying nature is viciously competing for material and energy. And so it designs the right material and the right structure over eons, Indeed. like a human bo uh, bone design. Here we have high performance computing, supercomputing. So in minutes or hours, we can mirror that process of per perfectly right. Pareto optimizing from a, an efficiency standpoint against all the requirements, a structure, and link multiple functionality, such as braking and suspension. Indeed. Well, I mean, it's beautiful and it's fascinating. And one thing I've said with regard to engineering, if you want to see something that strives for the perfect engineering based upon the circumstances it has, look at trees. They're always sure. looking for a perfect, um, a perfect efficient way for them to get light, sunlight, sure. live and grow based upon the areas they have. And your constraints, you have, maybe you have a brake dish, you have a point, you have pads, but how can you, how can you utilize that AI to design this most efficient structure in that same way, yes? The same vein as nature. No, exactly, and, and I think really an even you know, stronger example is when we do multi-component structures yeah. like that. Let's go frame. look at the uh, rear subframe, yeah. So the other one here, is this in fact the rear subframe that the suspension and engine transaxle uh, connect with? Yes, it is. And, and here I'd like to introduce uh, Lucas Zinger, Perfect. who really has led our automation efforts for uh, multi-component uh, vehicle structure assembly. Awesome. Perfect. Lucas, what's going on? Tell me about this. Yeah. It's incredible, but what, what do we got here? Yeah, let me give you some details here. So when we're talking about digital production and our system, we've really tied together three pillars into one integrated system. Okay. The three are you know, design software, true generative design software that takes into account the AM process yes. and the assembly process. Yes. The second is AM manufacturing. That's machine spec, that's software for the machine, and that's materials. So all our own materials. And then lastly, it's automated fixtureless assembly, which this frame really puts on display that fixtureless assembly right. process. So here you see 17 parts put together in about seven minutes. So industrial rates at a cost point that is very attractive to the industry. Got it. We're talking about four to five times more attractive than conventional uh, body and white welding processes. And importantly, our joint architecture and our process allows you to shift from one model variant to another without any tooling change. Yes. So there's no hard tooling in the assembly. Not only is there no stamping or casting tooling in the manufacturing, but the assembly itself doesn't carry that tooling fixtures right. either. So we can dynamically shift capacity, very various models, uh, all go through our system with just a software change, Indeed. no hardware change. Indeed. And so I what I would say is if you're going to create a digital system, everything needs to be toolless and fixtureless, every aspect of it, including the assembly. And that's the genius of it. Indeed, and we were speaking last night uh, relating to just that in a in a worldwide uh, connecting of the nature of the manufacturing process. Sure. Uh, the, the idea and conceptualization so things can be manufactured simply and efficiently anywhere. So imagine any small design team. Yes. Anywhere on the planet, through the cloud, can access a set of, and the technology company is called Divergent Technologies, yes. a set of divergent tools that is linked to that database of materials and structures. Yes. All materials purpose built for whatever is the application. That small team takes that, has their design, their vision of what product they want to create, uses that software to generate that design completely optimized to be built on our system and assembled on our system. And then simply locally, you have printer and assembly modules that we run. Yes. And those can serve any company, any brand, any structure built on our cloud-based set of tools. And so locally around the globe, you have teams and that's divergent comes from uh, divergent evolution. 
just like you know Darwin saw the common finch and the Galapagos yeah. go to 34 different uh, niche environments and become 34 different subspecies and adapt around the world local teams can adapt to local product local need but at the same time that they're doing that adapting obviously the database of not only structures but all of these materials is instantaneously growing yes. every team locally has instantaneous access to the global data set yes right so you have localized nodes global data sharing meaning for the first time you'd have complete innovation access globally right while maintaining local manufacturing and the local manufacturing footprints never become obsolete because they're part of an adaptive machine so you have a per a permanent factory footprint as the machine evolves it evolves structures as the machine evolves it evolves itself and rebuilds yeah. itself as the next version it's it's so fascinating uh, you're, the the levels of which we're speaking of it's a worldwide information and knowledge sharing in that regard with the manufacturing and the needs but effectively what what you're doing or what this is uh, the start of is global ma manufacturing becoming almost natural organic yes it actually is now then integrating itself using biologic all processes into the biological ecosystem of yes. the planet let's, and let's in that in you're close, taking yeah. uh, you know and, and Lucas has played a, a large role in developing these materials and you should talk a little bit about this material yeah. Lucas but you're taking materials and processes that create dematerialization mm -hmm. so dematerialization just like nature uh, is competing for material and energy right. it's going to use the minimum against a purpose this is optimizing to have perfect efficiency. Yes. So just like a, a beer can 50 years ago required 83 grams of aluminum and was 100% mined, yeah, yeah. 50 years later, 83 grams goes to 13 grams and 76% is recycled. This is radically re decreased material and energy flows yes. as nature does. And with the materials, make them all closed loop so they cycle through the system. So it's like a, uh, a localized alpine meadow, an alpine meadow that circulates phosphorus and nitrogen and CO2 right. and H2O, but we're recycling super efficiently used alloys and other materials within the same localized system. So the, this is then for the first time, rather than basically exploiting nature, it's integrating into nature with nature's processes yes. using human mind and technology, high performance computing, materialization processes, optimization processes. That's fantastic. Um, thank you. Lucas, can I speak with you relating to just some aspects of how this designs? Um, it seems to me in looking at it that perhaps when you put this into a computer and you're designing it, you have to pick up your hard points. Like, what are your constraints, whether it's a, a brake rotor and a hub and a bearing, or it's a particular engine or motor and drivetrain. So you pick up your hard points, and then you effectively tell it what stresses and things they have to go through it, and then all of this effectively grows through the AI. Is that a, a basic, how it happens? At a high level, you're spot on. So really, our starting inputs yes. are our design volume. So in a vehicle, where are our keep out zones? What volume? volume can we actually fill with the structure itself versus the vehicle systems, right? From there, it's where are our attachment points? What systems are we picking up? Suspension systems usually when mm -hmm. we're doing rear frames, front frames. Uh, what are the load cases we're seeing? So when we're working with OEMs, which Divergent has several OEM partners that we work with, they send us the load cases for that vehicle. Those oh, are high level inputs for that frame's design. Mm -hmm. For the Zinger, we designed our own load cases, seeing that as our own vehicle, and that led the design of this frame, right. for example. But yes, at a high level is really design volume and load cases, only two inputs. And then we've designed the actual optimization software ourselves. So yes. we're not relying on a third party for you know generative design software or CAD software. We're really doing our own software ar architecture in-house, which is bi-directional evolutionary structures optimization. So we're adding and subtracting material where needed, and we're really Pareto optimizing for that frontier where we're getting a design that is 100% optimized for that load case and for that mass target. On top of that, uh, we have a higher level of decision making where we 
also consider cost and throughput. So if we're working with an OEM that has a cost target, we understand our system well enough and the software understands it well enough where that would affect the design. So yes. for example, splitting a frame into more pieces will allow it to nest more efficiently in the printer itself. Okay. That'll drive down the cost picture. Our yes. software understands that, so we can balance a cost target with a mass target and hit the true Pareto optimization yes. of these high level you know, targets. One thing I would add with that is, as you're doing that optimization, obviously, you're actually creating the manufacturing and assembly instructions. And Lucas, why don't you give an example of what I mean by creating the, for example, assembly instructions. Perfect, so along with design software, uh, we have a factory OS and we've got software for the 3D printing and assembly. So yes. for the assembly aspect, uh, there's really two main instruction sets that go into a robotic system, which is the robot programs themselves, the motion programs, and the IPC, industrial PC conductor programs. We have automated the generation of both of those instruction sets. So for this 17 part assembly, <laughs> for example, the order that these parts come together is determined by our software, not by our engineers. And that's actually a non-trivial problem. Yeah. Our assembly cell is so flexible, there's many right answers. Determining that lowest cycle time is done in about two minutes by our software solution. And doing it that quickly allows us again to feed that back into the first line of optimization of the design software. Yes. So now we understand, okay, if we split into 20 parts, it has this associated yes. cycle time. 10 parts, this associated cycle time. <laughs> And how, on top how long of that, would it otherwise take? so when we were doing it manually, when we first started, you know, building these software tools, it was taking my team about two months to come up with a real usable sequence. We're talking about two minutes now, That's radical okay. time saving. And on top of that, we're placing all the manufacturing features. So this feature, for example, where the robot grips the part, uh, that is printed directly into the part itself and that has been placed by our software to be in a mass optimal place. So it's an area of the part that inherently would have, for example, a higher gauge to the outer structure. Oh, yes. That's where we're gonna put that assembly feature. So even the assembly features here are on that mass efficiency uh, optimization kind of frontier. I see it. Now, I, I absolutely love it. I love the, the, the th I love the thought and philosophy and everything behind it. This is why I'm saying it's next level, guys. So if I can do the typical Star Trek dumbed down metaphor, let's see if I get this. <laughs> With regard to creating this structure and then ultimately an entire vehicle. So when you are going to design a vehicle, you have certain things from third parties. Maybe you have an engine or a transaxle or your hybrid systems. You have uh, wheels and tires, et cetera. Those is it really passenger packaging? Yes. Right? Passenger, uh, yes. Powertrain architecture? Then you're really taking those two and you're creating the design volumes around them. Yes. And then the software steps in and in a multi-material, multi-component, functionally integrated approach. Yes. Creates that perfect integrated structure. Indeed. And, and on that note, what I was mentioning with regard to those parts, your constraints, those are the things you're utilizing yes. to utilize to create your car. I see that, or I think of nature in the sense if you have uh, land, maybe it's on a sloping hillside, the sun hits it in a certain way, you have certain air, you have a certain climate, you have certain water, and if a tree is gonna grow from there, it's going to find the most efficient, ideal uh, structure to utilize all those constraints, which exactly. is what I think is exactly how this car is being designed. Yes, the, the, require, the human requirements reflect the actual landscape environmental requirements stresses and loads yes but this time it's humans looking and and that's why we do want to transform the existing built human landscape from one that's at odds with nature from an efficiency standpoint mining standpoint use of material standpoint and aesthetic standpoint into something that's integrated into nature where that human set of directions is compatible with the existing biodiversity and environmental landscape around it. And you're basically saying, we're designing this into landscape. Yeah. Just like, you know, if you look at some of the early materials that a Frank Lloyd Wright used or saying, no, you don't put a house on top of the hill, but you put it on a slope and you integrate it into nature. Yes. 
you're going, going to have design teams use these tools to integrate into the landscape, to integrate into the ecosystem, these products that we create. Very cool. Um, guys, obviously we talked about some high level stuff, but it's important, it's interesting, and I hope you're vibing with it. I'd love to do two things before we go. Can we kind of show or can we pick this up? It's incredibly yeah. light, isn't it? Kevin's pretty strong, let's see him pick can it I, up. Can I get in on this? I want to <laughs> feel how heavy this is. Andrew, can you take this? Are you just going for it on I'm your own there? Sure. Uh, Holy mackerel. All right. Rebel. 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 There, there, nothing in the past, structure-wise, would be that light, and that's wrong. Nope, Love it's it. true. This is it. It's, uh, the this, is, this is the turning point in human history from analog design and manufacturing of atoms to digital design and manufacturing of atoms. I love it. You figured out a way for the engineering to evolve itself just like nature, like that. Yeah, Perfect. thanks so much, really. Oh, thank you. Well, I gotta, I'm gonna walk around your car. It's an awesome avant-garde piece, my goodness gracious. Um, just obviously the design captivated me and what we've been speaking about here, but you've created something incredibly exotic and avant-garde and I love that. So let's start with this, the, the seating arrangement. What, what was sure. your thought there? What, what made you go that direction? If you love driving cars, you want to be sitting in the middle of the car, right? Yeah. But you want to have a passenger. Yeah. And so to do that, you need to have a tandem seating, jet fighter seating. Right. Which also from the imagery, the inspiration, you not only have that form follows function, but you know you also have the thrilling, exciting experience of having two people yeah. in tandem do that. Then you minimize that frontal surface area for aero, but also by minimizing the front of the car, yes. you're creating design space for ground effects aero Indeed. and aerodynamics. And if you have a strong hybrid, this allows you to perfectly package all of the elements yes and also you know this kind of roof line yes actually comes from a Bauhaus curve oh. that they considered to be something that would evoke the idea of we're, beauty as an archetype in the human we're mind going back to like 20s 30s Germany yeah so you're looking at it looking at that curve from a design standpoint so it's not only you know uh, very functional it's beautiful and then I looked and said to me, you know, growing up and being a fan of Can-Am, obviously Jim yeah. Ball, I looked at the T70 Lola shrink wrap front fenders and oh, yeah. said, have something beautiful and sexy just like this. And by the way, when we rolled this car out the first time at Laguna Seca, yeah. the track manager here, she said to me, Kevin, this is the effing sexiest beast that's ever been on the track. And I said, Oh, come on. And she's there. I've done this for 20 years. I've seen every uh, car. This is like the sexiest now, beast I've ever let's seen. Let's talk speed. If I'm not mistaken, it's pretty darn fast compared to other production cars right now. What's the deal there? Sure. So, I mean, they're, you know, from a, a track standpoint, this has a 3.7 to 1 lift to drag. So it has enormous downforce. So on Coda, where we ran about six and a half seconds faster than the McLaren uh, production track record there yeah. about a month ago. Uh, at 190, you're generating almost 2,000 kilograms, kilograms oh, wow. of downforce, so 4,000 plus pounds. But this vehicle is, you know, with the MGU unit yes. putting uh, uh, additional horsepower back into the crank, you know, it has, through the electric motors, the MGU and the ICE engine, about 1,350 effective horsepower for a dry weight vehicle of 1,250 uh, kilograms, 2,750 about uh, pounds. You know, that is the, you know, and, and that is the best power to weight of any vehicle with high downforce that's a production vehicle. And having a 2.88 liter, 950 horsepower yes. dual turbocharged motor designed by us, built by us, that's the most power dense production motor ever. So you package it all right. together, whether you're talking about zero to 60, quarter mile, track performance the thing is a monster yeah indeed I, you it's know, a I, sexy beast that's also a monster when you unleash uh, it I, I'm so excited to meet you both and see this uh, and share it with everybody out here because honestly you guys have just left every single supercar and hypercar manufacturer in the dust they, they've been what, what, what have they been doing <laughs>
I love all of them, so <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm like only going to say we, oh, no, they, do, we do our, we do our own this. thing. <laughs> They've been making very pretty and inspirational cars that we all enjoy a lot. It just happens that you all found a brilliant spark that I think is a, a turning point in a moment of manufacturing around the world and awesome automotive design. Um, I am I am absolutely, I'm, I'm smitten. This thing's gorgeous, it's fantastic, and uh, hope to experience it again with you guys one day. Cool, thanks so much. No, this is, this is sort of Palo Alto Technology Garage meets like Cleveland, Ohio, uh, hot oh, that's rod right. garage. I forgot you guys are from that area too. Yeah, I, I, I am. Yeah, I was, I was. He's actually international. He was born in the UK when I was, was living he? there, uh, and we're Californians now. Gotcha. My, I, uh, I was actually born in Rocky River. We're from the Cleveland area. Sure. Cool. Well, guys, thanks so much. I appreciate it, Kevin. Hey, thanks thank so much. Very much. Oh, thank you. It. Yes, thank you. Uh, guys, look them up. How do how do they find you the best? Uh, you can go to zinger.com. C-Z-I-N-G-E-R, it's like the C-Z and Czar, the C is silent, uh, or uh, Divergent3D.com. Got it. E either one of those companies, and please come and visit. We'd awesome. love you to learn more. And, uh, and Where are you located? We're located in L.A., so the factory is in Torrance, which is right on the edge of L.A. Perfect. All right, guys, thanks so much. Hit that bell and subscribe, and, of course, look forward to seeing you guys next time.